today's topic is about how we embrace the scientist within. And it's, it's a great topic because a lot of people don't think about it and it's a little bit outside of the box. So uh, again, my guests today are Dr. Dean Colston, who describes himself as an emotion scientist. Most of his research has been focused on the role that emotional intelligence plays in learning and in health. Hi, Dean. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Dr. Uh, we also have Dr. Vanessa joining us again, who is a PhD immunologist and helps us out with all sorts of interesting uh, other immunology-related topics and non-immunology-related topics, as the case may be. And then we have Dr. Killian, who has been, I think, on almost as many shows as I have at this point, who's our <laughs> resident neuroscientist and also um, enjoys being here with us, which is very unusual trait and neuroscientists usually they like to <laughs> kind of hide so we thank you for that killian um, it would be a, a a very boring show without uh the unique combination that you three bring but also uh in terms of our series um it would be a, a lot less fun without the influence that killian has brought to these uh episodes so um the first question, I'm just going to throw it out there and then I'll, I'll start um, passing it around to you guys. But when did you decide to embrace the, the scientist within you? You know, what, what was that journey like? So I don't know who wants to take that first. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. Um, oh, so do you, want to, I, do you want to start with that, Dean? Okay. Go I am happy to go it. with this one. I'll tell you why. Well, first of all, it's very meaningful, but... Um, when I was a youngster, my sense of wonder and my love of space science was fueled by the TV show Lost in Space and, of course, Star Trek. And so I found the show so captivating as a youngster, uh, not only because, uh, you know, they're focused on science, they're traveling to new worlds and meeting new civilizations, but I felt like I identified with some of the characters and I always felt like if I could have been on the show, I would want it to have been one of the scientists because it just felt like it would have been a natural fit. Like the characters, I was just curious, curious about so many things, including many of the, uh, the um, you know, the topics that they covered on, on their shows. So that's where mine began. It was as a youngster and um, yeah, that, that stood out right away. Thank you for sharing that, Dean. My journey also started when I was young, but I have decided that I'm going to answer this question last since I'm hosting. Uh, so uh, Vanessa or Killian, which one of you wants to take that next? No, I can go next. Okay, go ahead, Vanessa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so actually like Dean, my, my love of science started when I was actually very young. Um, I as a young girl, I like to play outside. So funny thing is I would collect stuff, right? So I would come home with um, rocks or leaves or <laughs> all of these little things and I would study them. You know, I like to compare them. I used to have a rock collection. I liked to look, to look at crystal structures. So very early on, my parents realized that I probably would become a scientist. And so I remember um, that my mom got me a science kit probably when I was about seven or eight. Uh, I'm very fortunate to have very supportive parents. And I loved it because um, I, like I said before, I would come home with collections of stuff, including rocks. And in this kit, you could take a string and put it in sugar water and make rock candy. So I spent days and days and days making rock candy until we had way too much sugar in the house and um, running around outside with a little magnoscope that I had. And it was just great. I had a good time. But yeah, as long as I could remember, I've been on this journey. Wonderful. How about you, Killian? You can't hide anymore. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, similar to everyone so far, I've, I was intrigued by science and scientific concepts from a very young age, but I didn't think they were for me. I didn't think I was meant to be a scientist and I didn't think that it was something I could pursue. Um, I'm from a working class family. There were no scientists or healthcare professionals or anything in my family. I had no role model to think, oh, you can do it, I can do it. So I actually didn't look into 
specializing in science, majoring in science, none of that for many years. I went to uh, undergrad um, undeclared for a while. I was always good at writing, loved reading, good at arguing, as you may have noticed on the show. Um, so I started as a philosophy undergraduate. Uh, once I hit, you know, 20 and my brain started maturing a little bit, I said, well, where am I going with this? I don't see a clear path. Um, and at that point I switched to psychology and it was actually in a cognitive science class at the end of the course. Um, the professor was really impressed with the progress that I made and the work that I'd done in the class. And he invited me to come to his lab and work as a research assistant. And it was that mentorship that showed me, actually, I do have the aptitude to follow a science career. Um, it's something that I can excel in and it's something that I do love. So that's very interesting, Killian, because um, I have similar experiences on the one hand to Dean and Vanessa and on the other hand to you. Um, it's, it's almost, uh, it's almost kind of a strange little mixture we have here going on. Um, so my journey started when I was about seven or eight, as, as Vanessa was talking about with, you know, the chemistry sets and the catching of the lightning bugs and, and all of these just kind of very fun science things. Um, my grandmother was a nurse. Um, I don't talk about her much on the show, but there's, there's a whole story there. Um, but anyway, my grandma, one of my grandmothers had been a nurse and she had said that, you know, I have these little hands, which is so true. My hands are so tiny. And um, she said, oh, you have these small hands. You should become a surgeon. And so when I was a little girl, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a surgeon that was both a trauma surgeon and an infectious disease specialist. And then um, what I tell people now is that I went to medical school, just not in the way I had anticipated, because I, I do have a doctorate from a medical school. And so I um, I told my parents when I was eight years old that I wanted to be a doctor. And um, my father and his friend, who's a big shot cardiologist, um, sat me down and explained to me that women marry doctors. Women don't become doctors. It was a very traumatic experience for me at that point. I really felt like my spirit had been crushed. Um and then when I got to middle school and high school, you know, really my love of biology was really rekindled. My love of chemistry got stomped out by a chemistry teacher that I was talking a, a little bit about not long ago who said I'd never amount to anything. And um, I'm very sad that he's dead and I can't take my doctorate to go show it to him because I would love to go, look, I amounted to nothing. And, you know, I have more education than you, but neither here nor there. Um, and so I really kind of started to go down this this track, but you know I was still kind of hampered by this idea that um, that I really shouldn't do that. Um, and then I just decided at one point, you know, that I was going to go do what I wanted to do. Um, and although most of my education is not science based, right? Most of my education is, you know, have a have a political science degree, which is, you know, sort of a social science, not not so much the kind of science we're talking about here, but is a, is a science, much like psychology, of course, is a social science, even though I would say that's more behavioral and, and has a little more um, health implications than, than political science, because I, I don't think that science and politics should be mixed in together, um, although a lot of people do that, and I, I think that's very dangerous, but that, that would be another show by itself. Um, but you know, I did go on and did a, I did a couple of degrees that are more healthcare related. Um, and then when I turned 40, I decided that, you know, in three years, I was going to be 43, whether I did the doctorate or not, what am I waiting for? Um, and my youngest child had turned 18 and I just went, okay. And so here we are on yeah. the everyday science with Dr. Rebecca and friends show. So, um, Dr. So it's very interesting how all these journeys are different and very similar. Go ahead, Dean. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Finish your thought and- No, I'm finished with my thought, go ahead. I'm just kind of so intrigued with this topic and, and hearing everyone's story, it's, they're unique. And and I'm kind of sensing, certainly with Dr. Killing and, and in your case, and, and I'm sure Dr. Vanessa has a similar theme, but it goes back to the role models or lack thereof. And I can remember growing up like Killian, I didn't know this about Dr. Killian, but I too, I'm the old, well, I'm the oldest of nine children we were very working class and I'm a first generation college student and it was 
it was um, when I was a youngster, I was going to college no matter what. I was just so determined. But going back to role models, I didn't really like Dr. Killian and and sounds like uh, Dr. Rebecca, you didn't have the best experiences with science teachers, um, but I didn't have great role models until I connected with my teachers and maybe part of watching Star Trek and Lost in Space, it was an escape, kind of a fantasy, but through that, they were my role models, right? Not Dr. Smith, of course, on Lost in Space, but um, he was the, as you all know, the um, the bad guy, we'll say. But um, I think that's kind of what motivated me because uh, looking back, how did we get to where we are today in our areas of science and leadership? We, there was something within us, I believe. There was an intrinsic quality that drove us to excel in these areas. So um, I, I just wanted to tap into that area of role models because I think that is important. Many of us don't have role models growing up, but yet we figure out who to learn from or who we want to emulate. I, I think that's very true. So so for, for me, I have some complicated feelings about that, as I'm sure you picked up when I was giving the little snippets of this. Um, for me, I would say there were there were two pivotal moments in terms of of role models, not the lack thereof, but in terms of the actual role model concept that you're talking about, where people were actually, you know, mentoring me, like Killian was starting to say about, you know, this is when I figured it out. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the two would be, first of all, I started my college career. So both of my parents are PhDs. And, you know, in my parents' house, you were going to college and there was there was not going to be a discussion about a gap year or anything. You graduated. You were going to college. That that's it. End of discussion. Um, my mother and I had a conversation several years later where she said to me, you know, get as many degrees as you can. You know, they can disappear you in the night, but they can't take what's in your head. Little traumatizing, you know, as well. But, you know, this is the house that I grew up in. Like you were going to college, period. Um very different than you and Killian on the on the working class side, but still same idea. Um, so the the two for me though, so I started my college career at a women's college that no longer exists. It's now part of George Washington University, um, but it's it was called Mount Vernon College. And the reason I bring it up is it was founded by a woman named Elizabeth Summers who was um, thrown out of a class for asking too many questions, which is kind of what we were talking about the the last episode that we all filmed together and so she she goes off she gets so she gets thrown out of this class she goes off and she starts teaching women at home and then she goes out and she find found the what ends up becoming the college which is now part of George Washington um and and so while I was there and I was able to take some of these science classes you know it it's very much like I imagine my friends who went to the historical black colleges and universities you know you instead of being encouraged to make yourself small, you were encouraged to make yourself big, right? And to stand out. And all the students are women. So if you keep raising your hand, you're eventually going to, they'll, they're going to call on a woman because we're all women, you know? So it's a very unique experience um, in that regard. And to, to have science with some of these, these incredible women. Um, the other one was, so I left there, um, also a long story, but I left there. I transferred to Hope College, which is where I ultimately graduated from. Um, Hope, at varying points in time, has been outranking Harvard in terms of undergraduate research, which is also by itself an amazing accomplishment. Um, and when I was at Hope, we had a wonderful dean of sciences, who uh, dean of natural sciences, who is still a friend of mine. Um, his name is Jim Gentile, and um, Dr. Gentile is somebody I talk about him all the time. Um, but I used to call him Jim even when I was a student, because I didn't actually have him in class, because as I said, he was the dean. Um, and I had spoken to, to Jim and I said, you know, what I really want to do is I really want to look at this problem of bioterrorism and how do we solve those problems? What kind of solutions do we put in place to prevent things like bioterrorism from happening? And I told him, as I kept getting all this pushback from, you know, like I had looked at the nursing major and I got a bunch of pushback from the nursing faculty about everything. And I, I it was just a mess. And uh, Jim said to me, he goes, you know, that's a really important question. Those are really important questions to ask. There's a lot of funding in that. You should go ahead and look at that. Well, again, I haven't really ever looked at that question, um, but it was really empowering to me 
you know, to be able to have that, that experience. Um, and he is so happy uh, to see that I've gotten where I am. I was actually um, going to ask him to, to hood me um, when we had our graduation last year, but, you know, graduation got moved virtual with the pandemic. Um, but AT still has a program uh, where you can have a guest hooder and I was going to have him hood me um, for the doctorate because I, I felt like I would not be here as Dr. Rebecca had it not been for me having the opportunity to have someone like that in my life. Um, and by the way, Dean, he lives in Arizona when he is uh, not working and he does a lot of different science things with um, Richard Branson and some other people. Um, so what's interesting also is A.T. Still University was founded by Andrew Taylor Still, who is also, uh, he was an MD and then went off and founded the, this university, which then became uh, the foundation for osteopathic medicine and also kind of a person, right? It looks at the world a little differently. Um, and A.T. Still actively encouraged women to come to his medical schools, you know, at a time when, uh, you know, Elizabeth Blackwell was being accepted to Harvard as a joke. Um, and, and he was influenced heavily by his mother and his father was away a lot. And he saw his mother doing all of these, you know, very sciencey things in addition to more traditional roles that women were playing back in those days. So, um, I'll let Killian and, and, and Vanessa talk a little bit about the role model thing, but I, I would say that's my story to you. And I, and I think this is why I was so happy, you know, when Shannon asked me to join the board at next one Academy, um, because I think representation does matter. Yeah. Right. And she works yeah. with mostly black and brown youth and bringing them into the STEM fields. And I think that is so important. Um, like this whole idea that we have, you know, scientists like Charles Drew, who made such a contribution to medicine. But most people watching probably don't know who Charles Drew was. Um, and I think Dr. Drew really um, was that was just amazing. And I think we need to tell that story um, because, as you know, as you guys may, may or may not know, there is a shortage of um, African American male physicians right now. Hmm. So, yeah. Killian, Vanessa, who wants to piggyback on that? Sorry, went off on a tangent there. <laughs> Killian, you want to hit that? I see Vanessa's kind of <laughs> looking at me like, "Go away!" So, Killian, okay. no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Vanessa can go out. So, <laughs> what I'm going to talk about is the the service my role model gave to me, what, what, what role they really played that helped me um, sort of embrace the scientist within me and go forward in a science career, right? So what I needed and did not know that I needed and what I found in my role model was they showed me, he showed me the wall that I had built around myself that was stacked full of all of the things that made me think that I couldn't be a scientist. Some of them don't even make sense once I say them out loud, right? One of them was, um, I didn't know enough to be a scientist, right? I, yeah. Like on one level, I know that we're not born with knowledge. We need to learn things, right? That's how we, um, that's how we Im increase our knowledge. It's only by learning, right? But on another level, I thought, you know, I just haven't learned enough. I just don't learn fast enough. I just don't have the background of science. I don't have the foundation. I needed to know these things. I don't know when I was five, right? Again, out loud makes no sense. Internally, I felt like didn't have the knowledge and didn't have time to gain the knowledge, right? So that was one wall that I had built that my role model was able to show me and sort of tear down with me. And that's the service that I needed from a role model is to support me and let me know that a scientist is not a perfect intellectual individual, right? A scientist is somebody with curiosity who asks questions from the from nature, from the world, from other humans, whatever it may be, and is willing to pursue finding answers, right? So for me, I always come back to, I ask, how does this work? Why does this happen? Um, and what causes what, right? All of those are very scientific questions. And it's that foundation that is what I really needed and had to be a scientist, not some prior knowledge, not a, you know, stellar academic career from kindergarten on, right? I needed to be curious and, and be willing to pursue those questions. You know, that's very interesting. Um, I just had a conversation today with a coworker of mine who uh, was not a data person before I brought her on my team. 
and she's still feeling a little out of her depth with all the data stuff. And I said, you will learn it. I had my first day too. And so I think it's very interesting that twice today now I've had this conversation about, you know, we don't, we don't get knowledge in a download overnight. So um, Vanessa, do you want to add anything about role models for you? Yeah. So actually I think my story is a little bit different, um, but in, in a good way, it's interesting. So, you know, I think everyone here, I know I haven't said it in a show before, but everyone here knows that I'm from the Bahamas. And so I'm from a very, very small country where there are no large academic medical centers, right? There are no, there's no Harvard in the Bahamas. There's no large pharmaceutical company in the Bahamas. So, you know, when I was bringing home rocks and my parents decided to buy me a chemistry kit and they, you know, bought me a biology kit, uh, looking back on it, I mean, they really had to believe a lot in me because that opportunity literally did not exist in the Bahamas. And so um, encouraging me to do something that actually isn't accessible to me uh, really, I think was huge. And so I have to give my parents a lot of credit for that because you know ultimately I would have to eventually leave and pursue um, a scientific career in a different country just because of where I came from. So. You know, I'm happy to have had a lot of internal family support, but, you know, that internal family support, you know, did come with having to circumvent, you know, a huge, um, I don't want to say it's a hindrance, but, you know, a huge challenge, right? A huge challenge that I'm from a, com a country where, you know, at that time, we, we didn't have any huge academic research centers. You know, we didn't have that huge pharmaceutical industry, you know, so to to really encourage me to be a scientist and to really push me forward, I have to I have to honestly give a lot of that to my parents because they instilled in me the confidence that I could do it. And and then after that, it was just serendipitously figuring out how to do it. <laughs> you know? So um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned um, historically black colleges and universities. So I actually went to an HBCU. I went to Fisk University, which is a small uh, HBCU in Nashville, Tennessee. It's an incredible school. I had a wonderful experience. And my parents actually, interestingly enough, even though I wanted to have the science career, chose that school for me because I was coming from a small island. And so they wanted me to, again, be in like a small nurturing environment. Mm -hmm. And so I was fortunate to be in that um, small nurturing environment where I I didn't have to worry about being a minority in America and facing things that I never had to face before. And I could still focus on my education. Now, would it have been different? Like, would I have been able to catapult my scientific career if I went to Yale or Harvard or anywhere where I'm sure if I um, took the right exams, maybe I could have gotten it? Maybe, who knows? But uh, I think I have to say that being in a very supportive environment is what really allowed me to believe that I could be a scientist because I didn't come from a place where I had scientific role models, you know, there were no large PhDs floating around that were behaving that I could look up to. So yeah, I, I have to give kudos to my parents and I have to say the HBCU experience was incredible. It was great. It really allowed me to transition comfortably into moving into a larger country, which after then I was able to take on the experience of going to a large university to pursue my PhD and having the confidence to do that and not feeling as though um, my origin was anything but a blessing. So, so yeah. Vanessa, you know, <laughs> along that line, I go to events on occasion where mm -hmm. I will just keep raising my hand. And I went to one a few years ago and this woman, she came up to me after it. And she goes, I can't believe how much you kept raising your hand. I don't think I would have done that. And I said, they'll call on me eventually. Um, do you do you have this experience with people too, where it, it's like you know you you were given this confidence because whether it's women or historically black colleges or whatever, like we don't have an experience of being very different from the other students. Obviously, coming from the Bahamas, you had some difference probably from most of those students, um, but it wasn't like a it wasn't as significant as maybe a Harvard or a Yale. And, and I don't want Harvard and Yale people to email me nasty letters. I, I love Harvard and Yale as much as the next school, but it's a great you know example. Or Princeton, for example, Princeton had a whole big to do about women uh, not feeling welcome there a few years back. Um, so do you have that same experience when you go to conferences? Like people are just amazed at how often you hang in there and are like trying to make your point? Oh. I, I've never had anyone comment on it before, so I honestly can't say. Um, 
that I've had that experience. But I will say that I don't know if it's just going to an HBCU and also going to a smaller school. I think it's a combination of both, right? I think it's when you can get in an environment where you're, you know, like I was an international student, so I came in as an international student, right? I was different, but still the school was small enough and nurturing enough that I was able to really grow and thrive there. And I think it just depends on your personality. You know, some people are very, very, um, so I was a scientist, right? And I guess, uh, I, I actually, funny thing, I learned this stereotype coming to America, that scientists are supposed to be like nerdy, right? So I guess I would have been considered nerdy. <laughs> If if I wasn't if I was in America, but you know in the Bahamas that didn't really exist like that. But um, so yeah, I was kind of introverted and like you know I, I guess I would have been considered strange, right? You know, I was a kid bringing home rocks. I had a rock collection, you know. So, so you know, I think it really worked for me to be able to go to Fisk. Although I had some very 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 um, extroverted <laughs> friends and they did well there too. So I think it's just there is something to be said for being in a smaller nurturing environment where you feel accepted and welcome and um your professors actually do care about your future and you're not just another enrollment number you know so and i think you can find that within a university as well within a huge university um, but sometimes you'll have to be in a large university and then you have to get involved in maybe clubs or extracurricular activities to be able to find your tribe so that you can be in that nurturing environment even if it's within a microcosm within a huge, large university. Yeah, I I agree. And, you know, Dean, to, to your point, you know, one of the things that's so interesting to me is that, you know, I, I had educators say, oh, you won't, it, it, you know, you won't amount to anything. And I always felt like, well, what gives you the right to determine that? And somebody had told me this story about Einstein kept failing math and people kept telling Einstein, get out of mathematics. And I sit here and I go, Good Lord, where would the world be? Could you imagine a world without Albert Einstein in, in, in science? Like, I, I just kind of sit here and I'm like, wow. Like, that, that was a very, yeah. I don't know, that was a very profound moment for me uh, in my own journey. And I was like, you know, I was like, these people are, they just need to not be talking about that. So I think yeah. that was a really interesting point that you were making, you know, about, about role models. Um, and I love Vanessa's story um, mm -hmm. because I think, it's very powerful. You know, it's a very powerful story of what we can do for other people, right? When we're supportive of them right from the get-go in that curiosity and that that getting interested into into things. And I love Killian's story, which also Killian I have to tell you sounds very neuroscience-y to me, about hmm. looking at the walls that you put up around yourself and how they make sense or they don't make sense. I thought that was very powerful. But I also thought that that I can totally see a neuroscientist part of you kind of going, all right, well, I have this wall. Well, what about, you know, I, I can almost see you kind of processing that. I don't know if anybody else could see that, but that was very uh, interesting for me, both from a from a powerful standpoint about your journey and your your examination of that, but also from the fact that you did choose to go into neuroscience. That was, that was a really interesting um, combination. Um, so what do you guys think should be our main takeaway to, to other people? What, what would be like your final thoughts? And I'll start with Vanessa on that since Dean opened our show. Yeah. I mean, I think if you're curious and you, are, you have questions and if you think that there's anything interesting for you, you know, take a shot at it. Um, you know, speaking to what you said about Einstein, you know, um, so my parents, I guess, are very, very blunt. And I can imagine if I said to my mother, like, oh, you know, I keep feeling chemistry. I can't be a scientist. She would say something like, well, tutors exist for a reason, you know, because <laughs> there are actually things in place. And so if you have the right support system and, you know, it's not always like, like, you know, empathy, like, oh, you know, um, having a shoulder to cry on, but sometimes it's like, hey, you know, if you're feeling chemistry, get a tutor, right? That like you have to work for it. And I will say that my parents, you know, they did really instill that with me. You have to work for it. And these systems are in place for a reason. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with you if you're failing chemistry, right? There's nothing wrong with you if you're failing math. That's why Sylving Learning Center exists because a lot of people struggle with math. So I think it's one of those things where, you know, you are welcome in the scientific community. And even if you have a challenge, uh, once you could sit, step out and realize you're not the only one, lots of people have challenges. There are all these 
learning centers everywhere. There are all these tutoring systems everywhere. You know, sometimes you just need that extra help. You know, I would say just go for it, right? Just don't let anything hold you back. Just find the resource you need to get there. <clears throat> I, I think that's wonderful. I actually tutor students also sometimes. I just had an epidemiology student last week and she was absolutely scared to death to do her SIR model. And I said, don't let the math scare you. Don't let the math scare you. Um, Killian, you have any final thoughts you'd like to share? Uh, first, in defense of uh, Einstein and false rumors, he did not fail math. <laughs> There, there is a persistent rumor that he failed math. He did not. He failed an entrance exam. He was not successful in many subjects, but he was always successful in math. So on the entrance exam, he failed. He did pass the math section. It's this persistent rumor. Um, it's used in a positive way, but it is uh, false. Um, but just in, in defense of Einstein and uh, the need for truth, <laughs> and the, I love the, uh, it. Myths in the bud. I um, love it. And yes, we used it positively here, minor, but I do love when you fact check me. Thank you. Thank you for correcting us. Yes, um, thank you. So. Yeah, so uh, fact checking, I can't. It's one of those things that uh, I can't help. Once I learned it, I was like, I can't. I can't thing. sit idly by when I hear this again. Um, but. Um, it's okay to be oh, wrong in science. It's okay <laughs> to be wrong in science, and it's okay to connect science to non-scientific things. So Dr. Rebecca was talking about how the way I was describing my wall was very neuroscience-y, which is kind of <laughs> true. Um, but it also goes back to my love of reading and fiction reading, in fact. So uh, I did a 52 books in 52 weeks challenge quite a few years ago now, where it was only Terry Pratchett books. It could only be Terry Pratchett. So I read every Terry Pratchett book that year and uh, didn't regret it for a single minute. But if you're familiar with his work, he has this idea of third thought. So it's actually sort of, the, there's these characters who see what's happening and think about what's happening. And then they think about how they're thinking about what's happening and what's going on. So they're considered third thought. Um, but it relates to this, this idea Dr. Rebecca was talking about uh, of how I step away um, and try to figure out how things are working in my brain and why I'm behaving that way, which is very neuroscience. -y. Um, I will just add that any question asked at earnest is a good question. There are no bad questions, no stupid questions when they are asked in earnest. Um, and I think everybody has the ability to pursue the answers, regardless of degree, regardless of level of education. Um, there might be more barriers. It might take you a bit longer. You might need to ask a few more people, but we all have the aptitude. I think that's very well said. And again, I appreciate the fact check on that. <laughs> Good job. Sweet. And Dean, final thoughts? Sure. A uh, couple pieces of thought or advice that I would give to new college students, and this is based on my experience. Uh, one, especially those going to science, determine whether or not a smaller liberal arts college or a large university is going to work in your best interest. That's something I wish I'd had better counsel on. I went to a large university, which certainly has its benefits as an undergrad, rethinking it years later, and this is based on my experience teaching at liberal arts universities, there is something really special about smaller liberal arts colleges where uh, you get that one-on-one -on -one attention. And, um, and of course, I know you want to examine to see if the programs are a good fit, fit for you, but really think about that in terms of path, because that can make a big difference. That one-on-one -on -one teacher relationship or advisor relationship is, that's incredibly helpful with your uh, academic career. So that's one piece of advice. Uh, another is persistence. If you love physics and you've had some challenges along the way and you've heard some negative messages, but you love it, persist, persist, persist. Hang in there because um, if this is what you love to do, you're, you're going to, you should do something with physics. And um, so we know that academic achievement, there's other non-cognitive -cogn factors that are correlated with that. And I think that um, uh, there, you know, drive and persistence uh, is, are two examples. So hang in there. And the other thing that comes to my mind, and maybe this kind of ties our whole discussion about how we embrace the scientists within ourselves. And that is 
or at least this is my lesson, is that I understand now that what I know is not as important as how I think. So in other words, think of it this way. Science literacy is not so much about what you know, but it's how your brain is wired for thought and asking questions. And that's the really great thing about pursuing a career in science. So one last piece of uh, thought that I have, I do believe even if you don't have a background in science that everyone can learn to think and write more like a scientist and just in your everyday kind of, you know, day-to-day kind of decision-making, you can first um, start with thinking more about focusing on data, uh, facts and truth. And we had a discussion earlier about various types of truths. Uh, science seeks uh, the uh, objective truth and stay open-minded, but yet like any good scientist, keep a, uh, that kind of a skeptical mindset. I think those are all excellent points. Um, and I, I especially like what you were saying, you know, about the, the smaller environment versus the larger university, because, you know, I have a lot of people that tell me, oh, well, I want the name. And I always tell them, you can go get the name for a master's or doctorate, get the foundation, get a good solid foundation, yep. make sure you love what you're going to do. Um, so I think that that was really fascinating to me to hear you talking about that. Um, and, and I would say a lot more about that, but I don't want to dive down the whole uh, college student uh, rabbit hole. So, but that, I think those are all very insightful pieces that all of you brought, but I think Dean, the, the not having a science background, you know, we all have our first day in science. Um, and it doesn't matter if we're, you know, four years old and we're going, why is the sky blue? Or, you know, if we're 44 and we're going, does COVID-19 really cause this? Is this really a side effect of COVID? Or is this some weird conspiracy theory? You know, um, th these are all questions that we can ask from a scientific standpoint. And, and I love what you said also about writing and thinking like a scientist, because I do think that science is more than just being in a lab. And I think that we we need to bring that to reality. And that's actually one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this topic is I wanted people to see, you know, scientists as real people who have real challenges. You know, I think that, that we all had some conversations a while back, right? And every one of us has stories that we can point to about being rejected in science in some capacity, um, whether it was academic or whether it was an organization or what, whatever, we all have that story Yet, as you noted, right, we all persist and we all have, have come through that to have, I would say we're all brilliant scientists, but, you know, I'm probably biased. So um, I want to thank all of you three for coming to my show. This has been such an interesting episode, and I hope that everybody likes it as much as I did. Um, I tried to just sort of let us chat. I didn't really have a set of questions for this topic. Um, and I just wanted to let the folks at home know that you too can embrace the scientist within, whether you're two or 22 or 92, never too late. So thank you guys for a great discussion and I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.